Yeah, this is a better turnout than I expected. The, the topic is very specialized, so I thought many of you would, may not be interested. Um, Monkey signed this up. OK, that's your seat. That's my seat. Yeah. So no food? It's coming. Always when it arrives. So I will you talk. My slides, right? Right. I will talk, then we'll eat. The monkey will take the, on the second half. So, so my goal is to speak for the first, uh, well, 30 minutes or whenever PETA comes. Um, I did. Uh, Ken said it's OK. Uh, I got him. So we'll talk about repeat sequences, uh, how to call repeat expansion with a short read next gen sequence data. Uh, I thought about talking about the motivation. I actually don't remember why we started on this project. There was never a recollection of the moment of inspiration. It must be because a student, uh, Bo Lee, who got inspired. I think it was we were bringing up the CHP Maybe you and Bo. Issue, so yeah. I think I was hoping to get okay. involved. OK, so you are the inspiration. <laughs> um, well, STR, um, some people call those microsatellites. Uh, they are bigger than the indel. Uh, they are short tandem repeats, two, three, four nucleotides repeated many times. So they are important class of genetic variation associated with neurodevelopmental disorders and many cancers. Uh, Margie will talk about how we applied it to study ataxia. Uh, technologically, these STRs used to be discovered by cellular sequencing, but it's not very scalable. If you want to do a genome-wide scan on 100 <coughs> samples, that's impossible. Um, you, you can now do whole genome sequencing with next generation sequencing. Uh, but the read length is only 100, typically. Uh, if SDR expanded close to that or exceed that, uh, you don't get to have a read covering the entire allele. Uh, so there were two previously developed methods. Now there are three. So it's still quite specialized. I can only locate three publications talking about uh, methodology. They use split read mapping, therefore, can only detect short alleles, uh, shorter than a read. So here is uh, where we come in. Both developed method to uh, overcome the limit, so we can call the longer alleles longer than a read. Uh, uh, Peter, haven't capitalized your name. Uh, Peter is a rotation student, made uh, additional improvement on the method. Um, in Margaret's portion, we also have Erin in her group uh, who contributed to the experimental work. Well, two existing methods, lobster and repeat seek, uh, try to call STRs. Here, the black is the repeat region. Let's imagine, say, uh, trinucleotides repeated many times. If they are short, they can be covered by a read. So you have unique sequences on both ends. So you can call it genotype and estimate the length. But if you have longer ones, this black bar is now coming close to the read length. And at least in, in another case, when you have really long alleles, it's going to be longer than a read. Well, completely include the read. So Bo and I thought about this. We decided to formally define read types. LO left outside, left junction read, T for transversal reads, right junction, RJ, right outside. So that's five read types already. If the allele is longer than a read, so you have this in, uh, I for inside read. So exhaustively, there are six read types. But now we have read pair data, say 100 nucleotide paired sequencing. So how many combinations of such six read types can form? So we looked at it and so said, we thought, we need to build an exhaustive dictionary. So that's the six read uh, types. And then I should color that, read pair types. If you go, uh, go to the six by six combinations, there are only the 13 combinations that are possible. So there's no time for you to mentally compute all of this. But trust me, these are the 13 possible read pair types. Um, and then we give them names. 1 through 13 is the shorthand. More descriptive names, such as II or LO, couple to I. So, so these are the uh, information. 
types of information we want to extract from, say, Illumina sequence data. So these 13 retail types are assuming that there is an expansion. They are not assuming any more complex states. So if there were inversions and stuff that Ryan is talking about, there would be more retail types. These are the pure retypes if there isn't any That's strange right. That's right. 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 I have a next slide to uh, to explain the read types. So, so that's still the table from the previous one. Our type six would be called L O L J. That would be left outside and left junction. Okay. Number seven is L O R J would be left outside, right junction, and so on and so forth. Um, this host of read types are possible when the allele is shorter than a read. But if this black bar, if the Leo is longer than a read, you get additional read types, such as II, both reads are inside, or outside in, or junction in, and so on and so forth. Oh, excuse me, sorry. Uh... OK, have a seat there. OK, so Brian, we are talking about having Illumina short read data. Mm -hmm. uh, when we have a situation where short pendant repeat gets expanded to a longer length, we define six types of reads, outside junction, inside, right junction, or outside. And then we turns out, if we build a dictionary of possible RTPs, read pair types, RPTs, um, we have 13 kinds. And then turns out, but the information we can extract is a relative abundance of the 13 types. They will tell us whether we have uh, two short STRs, or short and long, or long and long, and how long it might be. So, so that is uh, the heart of the technology. That's the information we want to uncover. Look at the heading. Relative abundance of read types are the function of d, r, and theta. Let me give the definition. I wanted to use a whiteboard, but apparently we need that for. No, you can put that. You yeah. can use it. We just lift it. Laura, lift it up. You can use it. No, no, no I'll just write here. Maybe. Okay. Well, that'll make it concise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very concise. So, so, so d. Kill that uh, projector. Uh, D is the length of the STR allele. Okay, so so that's the length of this black bar. Um, and theta is the the length of the read pair, but not including the two reads. So. Minus two times r. R is that uh, uh, read length. Typically, a hundred nucleotide. If you order it from the core, okay. So if the insert is three hundred, you would minus one hundred, and one hundred you would have theta equals one hundred right in the middle. So, so once you know these three, um, you can calculate the relative proportion of read types. Like how much is six? How much is eight? In the, so there are multiple combinations uh, of the situation. In this case, D, the STR allele, is in a range of zero to theta. Okay, so it's as short as zero, as long as this is theta, the interval inside the insert by subtracting the two reads. When this happened, if you tile all the reads possible, just think about how the reads can be generated in a uniform density. You would have this, these three bars indicating the type six. That is, you have a left junction read sticking in, and it will transform into the type eight once the, this end hits the other junction. And then if this end goes from this junction to the other junction, you transform from types 8 and 7. So the relative distance that's been traveled when you tile across, uh, the transition from one read type to another tells you the relative abundance of these read types. <coughs> so, so this is a situation specific for D is within this range 
and theta is less than r. But there are other combinations. I have a few more slides showing this type of piling. But so don't different genes have the same kind of repeats sometimes? Are, are you doing these like the triplet repeats? Triplet, let's, can be dinucleotide, trinucleotide. Whatever, but don't yeah. sometimes multiple genes have the same right. type of repeat? So wouldn't that kind of right. complicate life here? It, it will complicate the inside read. So, yeah. so if, if you have the same trinucleotide repeat, you don't know how to map it. Yeah, so but all of these read types have unique sequences outside to anchor it. So the question about mapping is very important. Let me go back one more. Go to this. That's what you missed, Brian. Okay. Um, the five types, left, jun left outside, left junction, transversal, okay. right junction, right outside. If the allele is really long, you have inside. This is actually not, uh, not mappable. Yeah, it, they, are, they could go in many other places in the genome. The rest can be uniquely anchored, with the exception that some, if these ends are too short. Right now, we defy it by studying BWA. We think if it's 20 nucleotide, it's mappable. It, you have 20 nucleotide of unique sequence. Couldn't you there even, if you identify ones that have that repeat type, go back to, since you have a very small set of of potential locations actually map them with less than 20? Potentially, yes, yes. So think about all the reads, say if you did a whole genome sequencing, you really rely on these uniquely mapped ones to gather a, what we call read set, a local cluster of read set containing these ambiguous portions that needs to, that, that has problematic mapping. So again, in this example, you have the chance of D to be in type 6, R minus D to be type 8, D and theta minus D and D, D. So, so these are the distances traveled before you transition to the next type. Therefore, they dictate the relative abundance. If you think about, so the previous example is D in the range of 0 to theta. If the D is in the range of theta to R, you get different kind of proportion. You go from D, D, and then this one is going to be theta rather than D. The next one is D minus theta, and so on and so forth. Actually, so, if you, so we were talking about what would be the 8 and 9 types, where you have the, what did you call it, transition or something? Transversal read. Transversal read. <laughs> As you got the other end, which does actually get you to the right locus. Right. So you right. could check for consistency. Check for shorter. consistency. So. So 8 and 9 are the most informative ones when the situation is favorable. But when you have read depths to be limited, limited, you may only have one or two reads of that type. So it's a trade-off. Do you use less perfect, less informative ones, but more numerous, or you use a few of these most informative read types? Again, so if d further is in the range of r to theta plus r, you have an, another series of numbers. And then further, if from theta plus r to mu, mu is this whole thing, theta plus 2r, it will give you additional type. So this all can be, um, in, you can do the algebra. Uh, this is the relative proportion of the 13 types. <laughs> if the d is going into the five kinds, the relative portion will go this way, and it will transition further. And then the, you know, r and theta have its own contest. They will change the numbers. So, so that's a tabulation. You can, um, well, this will help you to do the inference later on, as you can see. So if your uh, insert uh, D is moving from very short to gradually longer and longer, you will initially have type 8 and 9, which are in the black bar. That's a relative proportion of the 13 colors. And then as you move longer and longer, you transition to the type 1, 3, 4 dominate. And this is just modeling one chromosome, right? It's not modeling the fact that you have there is a complication. always two chromosomes and two types well, that was my going on. Too. That's a second complication. You have a diploid genome. That's you need the, to know right. your reads, how they are get sorted to the yeah. short allele and long allele. I, I cannot claim we solved all the problems. Uh, so, 
So if Paul wrote something that I don't fully understand, that Peter understood, but there are some things now that are understood, actually. Uh, but since my time is short, I trust you don't scratch too much deeper into it. Uh, but the, 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 again, the, the principle is there. Um, if you happen to observe the abundance is in this range, you, you have some information about how long the Leo is. If you can sort out the, the facing of the two uh, the diploid uh, genesis of, of the reads. Going further, um, this is both picture. Uh, he would uh, do read screen from clusters of reads that presumably come out of a single STR, and then make a guess on whether it's short, short, long, long, or short, long. And then this can be made further complicated by, you know, the, if you do short, medium, and long, you get you get get six genotypes rather than three. So if it's truly short and short, that's the existing method, obster or a repeat seek that can do the split mapping. What I talk with you about is um, to build some likelihood model uh, using the relative abundance of read types to estimate length. So this part, I think Peter wrote better than what Bo initially did. So this is from uh, Peter's write-up. If you observe n such read pairs, if you know the counts of uh, from 1 to 13, you, you say you got a certain number of type read pair type 1, 2, and 13. And then you want to estimate D. But you also know the probability of observing type I given D, R, and theta. Going to that big table early on, you get some kind of a pro relative proportion. Then this observation observing these 13 numbers, the chance of seeing that is really a polynomial, where it's pi raised to ki, p2 raised to k2, and so on, so on and so forth. So once you can construct a likelihood function, you, you have some ways to differentiate or numerically estimate uh, this unknown d, with another complication that theta now is not a singular value. It's a distribution. It's a, um, People who send data, you, you ask for 300 nucleotide sequences, and you actually get, say, 250 to 550 or a range. So, so that can be learned. I still don't quite know how feasible to use empirical distribution. Right now, one implementation is to just treat theta as a normal distribution. A, a lot of the analysis become easier. Okay, so, so this is actually the shakiest part of algorithm. If you I'll move forward. Trust me, don't challenge it too much. Anyway, <laughs> so so both did this comparison. Uh, ours is called uh, Starfinder. The two existing ones uh, are geared to study short and short. As you can see, um, we performed comparably when it's short and short. But when you have a short and long, uh, both methods performed quite quite well. So these are the sensitivity measures. Um, and I don't mind putting that out. It's, it's really because they're not designed to call longer alleles. Therefore, they fail completely. So there's, it's not embarrassment on their side. It's really demonstrating that we are doing what's supposed to, to be doing. Um, and then there are other reports about how ours performed for short, short, and short intermediate, long intermediate, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, so that's one demonstration of how it's working well. And then Peter did something else to estimate the uh, importance of the read depth. So if the true STR is 140, but you have imperfect data, let's say if you have coverage of 12x, you will send every, all the 12 read pairs into the machinery. It will churn out estimates with a wide range. <coughs> If you allow yourself the luxury of 50x coverage, you have a much tighter estimation uh, for this STR. That's truly longer than a read, but shorter than a read pair. But John, that also depends on how how much variation there is in the re in, not in the read lengths, but in the Insert fragment lengths. lengths. In because the fragment. I, I I forgot which paper whether this was published or I heard this in a talk. 
there was this amazing talk where they showed the difference between like the pre-1990 NG NGS and post-1995 or whatever, where people no longer do gel purification of, of libraries. And once, as long as they did gel purification, it was much, much tighter. And right. that will help with this too. Definitely, definitely. Um, I don't know. But Peter, I don't know whether we can get anyone what, what to isolate. What ground level complication you used for this yeah, estimation? Yeah, so is this was assuming a Gaussian distribution of incest sizes with mean like 300 standard deviation 50 or something like that. Standard deviation oh. 50. So it was but that's, somewhat realistic. That's more like gel purification. Yeah, I think the actual, tight. Uh, the actual libraries now have a bigger variation, is my understanding. Uh, yeah, so. And this is like just more like 300 area. plus minus 200. So, as I have it now, although I haven't produced uh -huh. the figure like this, yeah, I have it taking into account the actually observed empirical distribution. Okay, sure. Uh, well, the last slide is still Peter's. Um, he is showing trying to calculate confidence intervals going by going back to the likelihood function. So, so the likelihood is computed for every scenario where uh, if it's 12x, it's this wide. If it's 25x, it's a blue. If it's uh, double it again, 47x, it's tighter. The truth is a uh, black one. So you can see it's hit and miss. Um, but at least we have a toolkit to locate the best estimation and give you a confidence interval. Uh, is this a synthetic data set, or is, what is the test set? This is synthetic, I think. Yeah. He, he generated. He got a genome, he put it in the repeat sequence, but also the insert size, like he said, 300, normally distributed, mean of 300. So this is also dealing with uh, the very nice situation where you have unique sequence, basically, on each side, and then sure. an STR in the middle. Right, right. And it's, I'm working now on dealing with the complications where you have a lot of non-unique or other repeat. Yeah, that's something we should tell people is no. a lot of repeats have slightly different other repeats next to the repeat. So if you have a CAG repeat, you very often end up having also some CTG or some CGG nearby. And oh, so repeats God. are coming usually in, in, in groups. They are not like <laughs> unique, 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 repeat, 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 unique, unique, yeah, unique. Right. So there is, there is a, uh, the structure of most repeats is that there are regions near the repeats that are not unique either. And that makes, yeah. that's, that's, so, yeah. So, so we, we, Margaret, we kind of wrote quite upfront about the limits. We, we set ourselves out to deal with, first of all, pure repeats, that the unit is a singular one repeated many times. You don't get to switch in the middle of it. And then the two ends, oh, they're flanked by truly genome-wide unique sequences. And then you don't have two SDRs jammed too close that they would compete for the unique sequences in between. So, so there's a host of abomination that we excluded. <laughs> um, so we don't deal with those. So that, um, that's additional tries in Peter's hand. I'm done, actually. I'm done with my portion. So, so that's a, a relatively short um, introduction to, to the spirit of the method. Uh, the, the writing and the coding and the maintenance of the code is still rather um, involved. Perfect timing. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, perfect that's timing. Really nice. You can have a break now before I go yeah. on. Can we do that? Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, there's just Assuming everyone has experience. Is that high enough? Can you, can you hear? Uh, a little bit higher, please. Yeah. 
can do it later. I can. I can yeah. later. I can. I can continue. I think I maybe I should continue. You want to wait? Shall we wait a little bit for people to? Marcy is the MC. Yeah. See, I don't know if you want to just take a break real quickly. And just I think we just take thing. a break. It was a perfect moment to take a break anyway. Yeah. I'm I think so too. So we can just quickly try to get food and drink and sit back down. And then and I'm going to have a, so that I don't faint in front of you. Yeah, he's. Coming back from Amsterdam, where he, we had him do this transmark meeting there in Amsterdam, and he did such a nice job over in the Midas thing that the uh, CEO hired him to flew to Amsterdam to run the meetings. AV is a meeting. Uh, actually, it was you be it's an investment to the site it was then I just go Yeah. So I don't think it's simple to what say the way he could run things. Oh yeah. What just, I mean? Just requires doing it for everything. Like for the same thing. Usually the week or twelve when that started. I sent you a little note regarding why the meeting was announced. It was an innocent mistake. His school calendar was. Uh, yeah, he knew it was uh, somehow shifted in time by four hours. I have to convince my iPhone not to put anything in my first calendar. I feel like I was switching up between like the my first calendar to my own. The issue that I've had is it'll try to like automatically do things in time zones. So if I'm like at, if I'm somewhere else and putting it in here, I'll put it in at local time. But that's like the last time you fly back, it'll change it. And it happened to him and he lost it. Well, that happens all the time. And yeah. I, I, I think I finally managed to get my something. settings so it doesn't happen fine. anymore, so but it took a lot of like tinkering with it and trying to figure it out and not fail. Well, I've just on my computer stopped changing the time zone and then it works. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. You know what I want to do is just go by. Oh, but the setting is like. <laughs> Oh, I can't say I'm not back here. I think they have to try to wait. Oh, there's, I don't think there's any good way to do it. No, there's no good way when you come down the middle. Yeah, yeah. You got more brain there. Oh, no. It'll be shooting. I hope to save room for eating chocolate. That's how I look at it, okay? If I eat both, then I don't know. It's okay. easy for me to forego. I think you do it You know, it can. I'm going to be a lot. I'm going to be a lot. I'm going to be a I hate
and then check. So you want to turn the audio on? Turn off the mic first. Yeah, you were doing it. Yeah, very Okay, you're going to ask. It's fantastic. Good morning. How's it going? Uh, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to catch up with you. I have some questions. Okay. I think I'll leave this off and do this one. Sorry. And I don't know there. Are some like... hey, Margaret, it's there. almost there. They're getting the food fast. They were, everybody was hungry. John thinks it's better to wait. I think he's right. I think people. It's very short anyway. So we're going to have a good discussion. Yeah, this was very handy that we didn't have a quorum in the EC. Normally on Thursdays, 11 to 1, I'm always in the executive committee and they canceled it. So they canceled it today? <laughs> Oh, good. But well, they canceled it not because of that, but because there wasn't a quorum, even though I was available on this one. So they're having trouble with this now. I couldn't imagine. It should be based on your recommendation. I must be traveling. I don't know. I Now this is something I don't actually know how to do this. I think you can use the arrow. No, I don't want to advance. I want to, I need to click on this part of the picture and I don't know whether where, there's no mouse. Oh, there is a mouse. Okay, yeah, I was looking for the mouse. Okay, guys. So ataxia is the disease that I'm talking about that I work on and that we want to apply this to. And this is a person who's actually part of a subject in my study. So he's an he has an ataxic gait. Does that remind you of anything if you see how he is, walks? I can just stand here, but then I can't move up. So how does how does that look to you? I can walk like this too, so I'm like an ataxic person. How does that look to you if I walk like this? Say it loud. Trump? Yes. You knew what I was wanting. It, it does look like alcohol intoxication, and alcohol intoxication has actually this effect of, of giving you an ataxic gait. So most people with ataxia have troubles when they walk to their car to, in order to drive. Many of them have been arrested by the police thinking that they will be driving drunk when they are not drunk, but they can still go, are still uh, well, way able to drive. So they have doctor's letters for this. So this is... Ataxia also has sensory neuropathy and eye movement uh, things, and we don't want to talk too much about it. But one of the motivations of that that uh, Jun kind of, I guess, uh, in the beginning mentioned is that the most common way of getting dominant ataxia is by a CAG polyglutamate expansion. So a CAG expansion in the protein coding part that leads to a lot of glutamates that makes a protein that precipitates in the cell and that messes up the autophagy system 
and that the cell tries to remove, and thereby, in the end, the cell ends up dying. And if you do this to a certain type of cells called precursor cells in the cerebellum, you end up messing up with, a, uh, with the coordination between the brain and your limbs. So ataxia is not a problem with the muscles. It's a problem of the brain telling appropriately to the muscles what to do. And we have been looking. I, I, my first paper was in, uh, on, on ataxia was like in 2003, which I actually started on, this, uh, on a mouse model of ataxia when I came here in 1991. So I've been working on this for 25 years. And now exome sequencing will find new mutations. And we've about 10 different ataxias that we identified that way. And it's fine to find them. But we cannot find anything like CAG expansions. So if there is a new gene with a new expansion, we would miss it. And if they have, if someone happens to have a mutation that's a CAG expansion, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know where I should stand so that uh, I can, I think this may work. So, uh, so, so there are two problems. One is new CAG expansions or any other expansion we would miss, and secondly, we would miss known ones. So we collaborated with Bo and John to try to find these uh, repeats, and uh, most of this uh, John already talked about. So it uses uh, MGS exome uh, files, specifically identify sequences of 100, uh, of more than 100 of pure, small, unaligned repeats, and then figures out all these different junction fragments to try to estimate uh, new uh, these repeat expansions. And as June was mentioning, but maybe I should stress more, is virtually all of the known CAG repeat expansions that cause disease will be more than 34 repeats. So the situation that the other programs can identify, which is that the repeats fit within the read. Remember, 34 times 3 is, a, is 112, so that's more than 101, right? That, that situation is basically useless for us because virtually all ataxia-causing pathogenic mutations are in this realm beyond the read like So the, uh, it's only relevant when, when you accommodate for all of them, you, you can figure out uh, the smaller ones. But the, what we are really interested in are their larger ones. Oh. And so, so, uh -huh. so, so for normal genes, how many repeats? So that is, it's different for different genes. And I will give you the next slide actually has one of the examples. So uh, I, what I should also say is they only had one real life examples. And I think Peter has that too. So we have once wasted like $1,000 on sequencing a known CAG repeat expansion in SCA3. Because you don't usually want to spend a lot of money on known uh, cases because it's quite expensive. So the length in the normal case depends on the repeat, the specific gene. But it can be very close, as I will show in the next one, very close to this 34. But a lot of them are, let's say, 10 to 24. They're nearly all this variable. So nearly all of these CAG repeats are variable even before they become pathologically expanded. But it can be 20 times. It can be 35. And as we, as I will say in the next one, so the first case that Bo identified in addition to the known case was very astonishing. He said he found Huntington. I'm like, what? Huntington is, is a very different movement disorder than ataxia. So he said, and. At that time, and I think this is still true now, but maybe Peter has uh, can redo this. At the time, Bo was pretty good in finding new ones, at least the ones that he found we could verify experimentally. But he wasn't very good in estimating how long they were. And that has to do probably with the, the, the variability in the um, fragments that we have. So he just said that. It seems to be that this particular case, one particular case, has an expanded HTT gene. So we but molecularly looked at the HTT. So these are unrelated individuals. And these are two repeat extractions of the same patients where both saw the 
expansion and you can clearly see that there's one allele that's much larger than this and when we we can actually gel purify this and sequence this and figure out how long it is and it was interesting the repeat length was 35. And I actually yesterday just talked to someone who was working on Huntington and he said that this is extremely rare to have a repeat length than more than 35 and there's actually a literature on in uh, right now in the in the in PubMed that suggests that maybe expanded HTT alleles may be a modifying factor in ataxia. So this may actually be relevant, although it's not an ataxia gene. So what we found is 35, which is clearly more than 34, just barely. And Huntington disease usually starts only when you have more than 40 repeats. With your 36 to 39 repeats, you may have late onset, mild or no Huntington's. It's kind of variable and unpredictable. So 35 repeats is still within the normal range, but these are all patients with ataxia. But this was first telling us, yes, this, what he found was relevant and uh, was correct. It, what he did find a repeat, uh, an expansion of a, of a repeat that was maybe not relevant for ataxia, but that was correct. The second part was very interesting. We had two siblings, with re so when we gave Bo the exome sequencing data, he had them with four numbers. He did not know who is related and who is unrelated. And he found an expansion in this gene, which is called a taxin 8 other strand, which is opposite strand, not other strand, uh, which, which has a historical reason. And he found this in two samples that when we looked at that were siblings. So that made it very, very likely to be real. And that is very interesting because these siblings were two sisters who were referred to us as having recessive ataxia. So they were predicted to, to have a, a homozygous mutation or a compound heterozygous mutation. But what Bo found is uh, two heterozygous pathological expansions in this that uh, were associated in the literature with dominant ataxia called ataxin 8 OS. And just for those of you who want to do wet lab work, Aaron initially said, this is a false positive. I can't amplify this. And I'm a stickler on these kind of things. So I said, well, we need to have a positive control before we can say with absolute certainty that we could not detect this. So we received control DNAs from someone called Laura Ranum from Minnesota, who has basically identified this gene, where she said, OK, this is a sample with 60 repeats. This is a sample with 200 repeats, et cetera. And so that was used to optimize the PCR. And so these numbers of repeats are just the controls she gave us. And once we got the controls working, lo and behold, the two cases where both found the expansion actually had expansion, and they were slightly different which is something that I don't know, uh, we can talk about a little bit more. These repeats are, when they are pathologically, are often unstable. So Huntington, for example, is a disease where over the generations it often gets worse because once it gets to a male germline, the repeat gets larger and larger, and so the onset is earlier and earlier. And so these two siblings actually had two different repeat, uh, repeat sizes, and they were both different which is not unusual. So what does this mean? This is actually practically very important for this family. It changes the diagnosis from recessive to dominant ataxia. And that means that there are four children, so each of them has two children. Instead of being basically border, you know, 2% or whatever uh, risk, basically being told there's very little risk for your children because they were the genetic counselor said, well, this is a recessive case. The parents are unaffected. The, now the children have uh, had 50% risk. So the chance that one of the four children actually inherited this expansion and will get this disease is pretty high. So that this is very relevant for the family. And so we've talked with the, this is a family from Italy. And so we, we talked to the, uh, clinician there and made clear that it, that this needs to be verified in a clinical test. So this is something uh, we don't need to spend too much time on. But I, as a researcher, cannot give results to patients uh, in Italy or here. But it has to be verified. And this is uh, a little tricky here because the Italians will have the same problem we had initially of, of, of getting this essay to work. 
and in fact, this uh, the, we have had cases where this was excluded initially. I think this was one of the cases where it initially was excluded. But when you look in OMEN, which is a very good database for clinical uh, information, it actually says that this gene expands very rapidly through the generation and very often can be t mistaken as recessive. Just because the parents may have 20 repeats, and we don't have the parents in this case, and then the next generation may have pathological number of repeats. And this is true for a lot of these repeat expansions. So they may actually be mistaken for recessive, and that's specifically true in this case. Have they ever in, in families seen somebody get the long form, but it's not expressed? That you only have one of the alleles expressed? Or are they always? I've not heard that. But, the, I'm just, no, just, but I mean, that's that. There, there may be this may be an ascertainment bias because. People look at these repeats in cases with a disease. What you're asking for is other people, normal people, where, where that, that don't have the disease. And I'm not sure we have assessed that to a very large extent. Because these, such, an, such an allele would usually be missed unless you do special tricks, as I said. So in NGS, you wouldn't necessarily find it. So that's, that's it's a very. It's a big issue in general. I mean, for most of these uh, pathological variants, we don't know how many normal people have patho so-called pathological variants because usually people get sequenced right now because of their uh, because they have a pathological one, and you can't go to the Child's Genome Project for this because they don't have these repeats. They will miss them. This will be in the underlying garbage can reads. I mean, it's not there in the 1,000 genomes. Unless someone now does 1,000 genomes with very, very long reads. So if there is a 1,000 genome project with 400, 500 base reads, then we will get this information. And I don't know, John, do you know if anyone is doing that, or is, is basically all of these large-scale things doing Illumina short reads? No, there are a lot of new technologies yeah. So we may find this out in the next 10 years. The pathological yeah. extension <coughs> happens when they make gymnized cells or, or they will multiple in the somatic cells. So it can happen in the germline, but it's also unstable afterwards. So the I'm not 100% sure, but my guess is that if you see here, there is a little bit of a shade here. So my thinking is that this person actually has both this allele and then an expanded allele. And we definitely, so there are cases reported where not all cells are the same. So there may be more expansion going on in after the germline. It's a good question. People people know in general how this how why repeats lead to expansion overall. It's basically something called slippage for the uh, DNA polymerase, but uh, that can happen both in the germline and in the <clears throat> in the cells. My guess is the same answer as to Jeff that if it happens somatically only after you were born in some of your cells, we would never know. It may be there all the time. Older fathers. I don't know. What I know is in Huntington, for example, whether you get it through the father or the mother, the expansion is faster through the father than through the mother. And I don't know whether that your sperm competition is that reason or something else. But uh, I don't think it's known in ataxia in general. So what we are doing is we are working also with a, a person called Suma Dash, who is, uh, has a clinical medical genetic sequencing facility in the University of Chicago. And we and a neurologist and uh, like four or five of us got together to figure out what are potential ataxia genes that were, would be worth sequencing. So what she's currently offering, and I think I have this here, is an ataxia exome panel that she's actually, she has now done over 100 cases like this, which oftentimes the insurance pays where she's doing exome sequencing, but she 
says from the start that she's only looking at, and I said over 250, it's actually 346 genes, that are associated with ataxia or could be confused with ataxia. So she's looking, uh, when we made this, we made it clear that uh, there are some diseases that have ataxia as a component that can be confused with it. So it, it's very generous in terms of anything that could possibly be confused with ataxia we are sequencing in this case. And so what she's doing is she's doing <coughs> clinical sequencing, which is uh, to, a, to, a, to up to 75 days uh, full ex coverage, which is more than what we usually do for research. And anything that she reports back to the patient, she actually Sandra verifies, which is a lot of work and which is why this is relatively expensive. Now, what she says on her website and what every a uh, lab that does anything with ataxia sequencing has to say is that currently this exome sequencing does not screen for trinucleotide repeat expansions, which are the known cause of the majority of SCAs and actually also the most common autosomal recessive ataxia, Friedreich's ataxia. These need to be excluded before you come to us. So what we would love to be able to do is to have combine the exome sequencing, which will probably be replaced by whole genome sequencing, and use STR finder, and so that we have, that in the future there will be a one-stop shopping. So you send your DNA to Suma or to someone else, and STR finder finds if there are any repeats, and I think if you limit it to the known ataxia genes, the math will be slightly easier when you say, okay, there are these 15 different genes that can cause ataxia, we only test for those, and uh, we only test then for point mutations uh, in other genes if you don't find an NCAG repeat, because that's the most common form. So my, my sort of vision for the future is you send your DNA sample to one facility, and they will use SDR finder to find the CAG repeats, and if there's nothing in the CAG repeats, then you look for point mutations in one of the 350 or so genes. So that's uh, kind of where this can be used in the future. And that's many, all I have to say. How many genes, including ORFs, have a candidate pre-existing CAG repeat? In other words, if you <coughs> just went to the genome and looked and said, how many? CAG or any other repeat? Well, so, CAG repeats, I think there are about a dozen that cause ataxia. How many CAG repeats there are in the genome? That in, in a coding region. In a coding region? I don't know. I was wondering if you Actually, could make a panel that just targeted this kind of thing. This is like 20 or 30 or 50, maybe. But, like, not all of these, all of the repeat containing ataxia genes are CAG repeats. It's the most common, but there are. CGGs, there are CTGs, there are, um, and there are also like a, a small number of like five base repeats and 12 base repeats. So it's not all coding region and it's not all just CAG, and I wouldn't limit myself to those. But we can still make a list of all known ataxia causing any kind of repeats and look for those. So this, this method uh, would look for known genes. And what our current scheme with them is, but that for some logistical reasons doesn't seem to work, is if about 50% of the cases that she gets, they don't find any mutations in known genes. And we would love to get those next generation sequencing data to do research on. And somehow it never works. They, they have a, on their, when they say, we didn't find any mutations, but if your patient wants to participate in research, contact Margaret Burmeister, they have that on, on all of the reports. But somehow the communication between the lab and the physician and the patients never works. So we get still our, most of our patients by self-referral. I don't believe that it's because most people don't want to participate in research. Most people who have ataxia would, and, and pay four and a half thousand dollars to get, find out what they have, they would be interested in participating in research. But that's one of the sort of practical things still working. Okay. Now we can open the discussion for both the practical and the theoretical. Do you want to have the... 
or everyone wants to. Okay. So, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, just like a new example with these two siblings and uh -huh. family in Italy. So, what does it mean that they can get, uh, you know, tested, like, you know, in, you know, all the sort of, you know, testing that can be done now and you hope will be happening in the future? Does it mean that, you know, people uh, who already have it would come and find out exactly what the risks are for their children and so on and so forth? Is that the main goal of that? Or so why does that do, affect okay. the uh, treatment or anything like that? All of the above. So, so this is something, I'm actually on the National Ataxia Foundation's Facebook page and I, there are many discussions among the patients about this kind of issue. So there are some patients who say, well, why bother? I know I have it. I know it's going to be progressive. Why bother finding out? And there are a lot of people that, and, and some people say, oh, now I know I have SCA3. Well, it doesn't change a thing. I can tell you, I've, I've met one of the patients who said that his mother had it. He was caring for his mother. He knew what the disease was about and for a long time didn't decided that he didn't want to know. And then he decided that he wanted to buy a house. And he said, you know, that's when I got myself tested yeah. because I wanted to know if I needed a ranch and something that is wheelchair ac accessible pretty soon. <coughs> and he said, within... So, so the other thing is for a lot of these diseases where you don't have a proper cure, when people have theoretically a 50-50% risk, <coughs> if you ask the, the labs that do these tests, they always find more than 50% having... Uh, being positive, which basically says most likely people people have like I, I sometimes stumble. You know, if I had ataxia in my family, if you lean towards being very worried and anxious, you would start worrying about do I have it, don't I have it. I have a family that I recruited with 15 siblings. Every single affected in the family says Connie has it, and. Connie didn't have it. She is not the same <coughs> group, but they said she has it because she was having some flaky things, throwing a coffee cup around the room is what they said. And so there are these rumors and stories where you want to know, do I have it or not? But part of it is when people start to be symptomatic is very often when they get to know it, if they buy a house, as I said. The other thing is, if you want to participate in clinical trials, they often uh, want to have it limited to one form. So, for example, um, Huda uh, Zorbi uh, had found that lithium, which is a commonly used drug for bipolar disorder, works on mice with SCA1 mutations. So she did a clinical trial for people with SCA1, and only those who had SCA1 mutations were allowed to participate. So the genetic test was required in order to look at the clinical trial. and. The other thing is ataxia can have a very variable onset and a very variable pro progression. So some ataxias you can get very old with. So a lot, most ataxias don't have a mental involvement and you can be diagnosed at age 25 and get up to seven, age 75. But some ataxias have a much more progressive course and some people would like to know what kind of course they have. So there are a lot of answers to that question. But it's actually one of, neurology in general is one of the fields that has embraced genetics, genetic testing much earlier than many other fields. So uh, the, it's very common in, if you go to any sort of academic medical system and even a neurologist in the, in the community, it's very common that they would immediately send out a blood sample for genetic testing just to know and to be able to, to talk with patients about prognosis. Yeah. But I think that's a lot of it is psychological. A lot of it is that people tend to want to know. And I, I try to figure out what's the status in China and the status in China is basically that the neurologists don't even see the point. So I have not met neurologists and they basically said we don't test, we don't bother. What's the point? It doesn't change treatment. Nobody would pay money for getting a gene test done. So it, it, it is, I think part of it is culture that we tend to be a culture that would like to have explanations and knowing and many patients kind of like the idea, okay, I know now what we have. And we've, I mean, I, we've, we found a couple of new ataxia genes, but very often when we did the some sequencing, we found either 
you know, a, a known ataxia gene or a, a gene, a mutation in a gene that doesn't cause formally ataxia but some other kind of syndrome. And so for, for a family to know, oh, our kids have 4-H syndrome and there's a 4-H syndrome support society and I can talk to other people who have kids just like mine, it makes a world of difference for them. Okay. What about SDR? No, no. All these bioinformaticians are not mm -hmm. asking questions about... Okay, thanks. Thank <laughs> you.